Hi, everyone. Welcome to Stream and Hub Radio. I am Sage Stevens, the host of Shout Out with Sage. Today, my guest is a Hollywood staple. Most recently, he directed Crescent City, starring Terrence Howard, S.A. Morales, Nikki Whalen, and Alec Baldwin. Also, the comedy feature film Don't Suck, <laughs> starring Matt Reif, Jamie Kennedy, Russell Peters, my fellow Canadian, and Ellen Holman. His first directorial debut was American Sicario, which was released by Lionsgate and Saban. And most recently, he formed his production company, Elevate Media Partners. And today, I want to welcome to the show, RJ Collins. Hi, RJ. How are you? Very good. How are you? Uh, excuse the car, but I couldn't get to the <laughs> right location on time. So <laughs> that's all right. You're not the first. You won't be the last. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, my car is like four or five productions these days, anyways. I'm on my Tesla back and forth all the time. So that's good. Yeah. You were saying earlier you were going to name it. You should name it the 405 production company. I really <laughs> should. Yeah. I mean, I mean, half the deals I'm call and calls we're doing is on the 405 heading up and down right. the coast here. So. You recently just wrapped filming on Crescent City, correct? Yes. Um, so we did that in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was mm -hmm. kind of a perfect storm um, of getting the SAG waiver, uh, having it be a full independent film. So we were allowed to shoot it and we raising the money and everything. It just kind of all came together pretty fast. Um, and it was a script that uh, one of my best friends and I call him my partner in crime in Hollywood, Rich Ronet. He's um, we kind of grew in the industry together. He's a writer. Now he just directed his first feature as well. Um, he's an amazing partner of mine. We, he's written many scripts that I produced. And as all, he also wrote American Sicario that okay. we directed uh, directed together. Um, and uh, we you know, we've had a great partnership and it was great to uh, have my third film also written by Rich. Uh, Don't Suck, the second film I did was written by Rick D'Elia. He's a, a phenomenal comedian. And we could talk about Don't Suck next. But mm -hmm. so Crescent City came together. We <clears throat> took it to Little Rock, Arkansas. I've never been there in my entire life. <laughs> Went there and the film commissioner, Chris Crane, was an amazing guy. He literally almost picked me up from the airport and took me on a location scout himself. <laughs> so friendly. Like, I've never had a film commissioner be so hands-on. Okay. You know, we even had a drink at the end of the day. We laughed and talked about our lives and our kids and our families. Um, and he loved the script. And, um, you know, Rich and I kind of based this story off of a bunch of serial killer uh, kind of uh, the way they killed their their, their victims. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of made a collage of a perfect storm of these guys. Uh, and like, their, like their methodology and how yeah. they went about it. Yeah, their mindset, the reasoning behind what they did, but we really didn't want to go too far into deep, like depth into all of them. So we kept it kind of, we kept it fiction, but it's it's really based after true events. Okay. When it comes to story, what do you look for when you're, you know, developing a screenplay or picking something to to film? Yeah, it's funny. There are so many different types of films that I like. I'm a very <laughs> e easy audience member. Um, but it's usually just the story itself, the writing, um, something that's really, I know is also gonna be an international market as well as domestic. Uh, just because I've, you know, was a child actor and started producing at 21. I'm now a lot older, um, <laughs> 25 plus years doing producing and now directing. Uh, I really just, just want stories that move me and like something that's unique about them where I know I'm gonna have an amazing cast that'll be attracted to the film. Um, you know, it's just, it's kind of like a, I just look at it from, like I said, the aspects of, all right, is this in my wheelhouse? Now it's interesting. I'm clearly not a serial killer and uh, I'm <laughs> frightened by them, but I did right. a lot of research on it. And this was just a story I had to tell. I was very passionate about it. Um, I just go by what I feel like is going to be an amazing performance from my cast. Um, and I just feel like the audience is, well, they just love these kind of movies. I'm, I'm, I have a huge influence. I, I love David Fincher and Tony Scott oh, yes. and, and many of the directors and their style, Scorsese and their style and just like the music and the color tones and just everything. So this movie felt a lot like Seven to me um, and a few other blends of other films. That I don't like to compare too much of other movies right. like to be kind of unique to our own story. But I mean, there's it, it was phenomenal doing it. Um, I knew that if I did this film, I would attract the right cast to do it. 
So I try to find stuff that I like the story on, I like the writing, and I think that there's going to be a, a really a big draw for the cast to want to come and do it. As you know, cast is everything now to packaging, mm -hmm. getting distribution, mm -hmm. and raising money. So we Actually, try to find can projects you... that... Yeah, sorry. So can you go into that a little bit, like how you put the cast together with to get the financing and just sort of give us a yeah, little Yeah, so sometimes in producing and everything else, right, it's kind of the chicken and egg game. You kind of have to have the talent to get the money, but then you need the money to get the talent, right? Right. So sometimes it's relationship-based, it's trust. Um, you get the distributors interested in a story, and then you go out and you find the cast. Um, this one, we had people interested before, um, but COVID hit and just kind of stopped the project. So then we kind of revamped it. I jumped on as the director and then I just had some relationships I've built to help us get Alec Baldwin. Um, my other producing partner on this, uh, Edward Osipov, he, uh, he brought Terrence Howard onto the project. And once Terrence read the script and loved it, I mean, everybody loves Terrence Howard. So every actor was like, if Terrence is in, I'm in. You know, right. so kind of trickled down and then, oh, Alex in, so I'm going to do it. And then right. Esai came on board through um, a producer that's on this as well, David Lipper. He just happened to have Esai at one of his parties recently at his house. <laughs> it's just funny how these things kind of happen. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally and L.A. <laughs> it is. It's totally L.A. And so with the strike and Nikki Whelan, I've known since, I mean, she's phenomenal. She's such a beautiful soul. And, you know. She, I cast her in a movie in 2007. We've been friends ever since then. And I have not worked with her again. We've tried a few times. And this one, she was available. Mm -hmm. So the, these four actors together with the other supporting cast with Weston Coppola Cage, or Weston Cage Coppola, <laughs> sorry. He's got two last names. Right. And then Michael Ciro and, you know, Angel Nigam and a bunch of other people came onto the film and we just had a great time doing it. Um, but it's, it is a lot of relationship-based or you have to have a really good offer to the agents to get their attention. Now with the strike happening, mm -hmm. you know, we like, I mean, I support the SAG strike. I know what it's about, but we're an independent company and we wanted to put people to work and we did. And I felt really good about that. And the actors were really happy to go to work. And we had a, just a love fest on this, this, this project. Mm -hmm. The shooting was fast, but everybody brought it and um, we're very excited for the release next year. Cool. When you, you mentioned, foreign sales so how for those people that don't know much about how all that works can you explain sort of like how an actor you know how all that works with actors having foreign just you know helping with your foreign distribution and all that stuff yeah so there's you know all these all the foreign sales companies they kind of have their lists and they have their their numbers that they know that these specific names trigger these kind of sales overseas from all territories, from France to Australia, the entire world. And so um, just talking with them over the years and being a part of the markets and everything else and selling other films, we've just kind of learned, you know, and it changes, by the way. <laughs> Lately, it's been changing day to day, but there are certain names that are staples, like, like I said, Alec Baldwin. I mean, you know, unfortunately, with the whole Russ thing, you know, it wasn't fair, to, in my opinion, on that. And I'll stay out of the politics of that world. Right. But I, I, Alec is an amazing person and his work over the years has been amazing. Yes. And so I'm just all about the work, I, you know, and and Alec is a staple and he was such a pro. He came in, he shot, he did, had a fun time with us. He was so good. All the actors loved working with them. Terrence Howard, his experience and him leading the the pack there, being the lead with Isai. I mean, they just worked off each other perfectly. These guys always wanted to work together. It was almost like, felt like a bad boys kind of crew together. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun doing it and they, they trusted in me. I get, you know, I really give my actors freedom because I'm, you know, actor first. Right. So I, I approach it as here's the script and, and we talk about their characters and how they see it. And then we kind of blend together their, their take on it. And then we did a couple of, you know, tweaks of the script because I like to give my actors the freedom. We go in, we block every scene before we shoot it. Things change on the fly. We make it work and just make it as honest and true to them and us in the story. And uh, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I give my actors a lot of freedom to bring, like, it's like essentially this. I cast this actor. I know I'm getting from that person. And whatever mm -hmm. they want to bring extra to it, it's just a bonus. And I accept it. I'm open arms about it. And I think that's where the actors feel the freedom with me is, I'll give them right. that freedom. And then if we have to change it on, like, you know, I'll give them that take and then we'll try something different on that one to get my story part out. Right. You know, we do that. And so, I, uh, you know, it's just, it's just learning it and being comfortable with that, knowing that it's going to evolve and change. 
And as long as you make sure you're still, the story doesn't change too much off to the side, it's not going to work. Right. You know, we win on all time. And this is what the story did. It evolved as we were shooting it. And they all had great ideas for their characters. And we used that in the script. So I think people are going to be very happy with Crescent City. So you have the script as like a, you know, a guideline or like the base foundation, but then you'll allow the actors to like sort of go a little left or a little right. And then if they're going too far off, you bring them back in, correct? Is that what you're saying? No, well, yeah, it's kind of, well, it's not even that. It's more like we'll come up with a plan of what we want, the intention of this, of that scene and what the emotions I want out of that scene for them. And then, you know, if it evolves into whatever it is, it's fine. We, like you said, so we shoot the scene. And then if they have some ideas, then we'll do another take and let them kind of go off and be a little more free with it. And usually about, you know, about 90% of the time, the actors spot on <laughs> with, with <laughs> the organic side to what they want to bring right. to it. Well, at that level, I, I'm, you know. <laughs> like I said, I'm an audience member and I'm also, you know, storytelling, but it's like, when you're working with these actors, it's just it's just such a fun experience, and watching them bring it to life, it's it's just it's just makes my job a lot easier. Right. How important is authenticity and creating that when you're taking the screenplay and turning it into the film? And how do you how do you how do you keep it like true? You know, it's funny. I shoot things very practical. Mm -hmm. I'm not the big CGI specials. I don't want to do all that <laughs> stuff. I'm very true to the story um, and and uh, everything for me has to feel very real. So even my stunt coordinator with, with the fighting sequences, we made it like, there's no like crazy stunts where you're like, that that couldn't happen. I don't <laughs> do that in my movies, like Sorry. not yet at least. Maybe <laughs> down the road, I'm gonna do a big action comedy and I'll probably go, I'll push the, the level of that. But um, right. I, I, I think it's, for me, when I watch stuff, if I don't believe it, then it just, it just boils my skin. So yeah, well, it takes it, you out of, it takes you out of the moment. Yeah. So like, you, you're like, saying, wait, what just happened? Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I want the audience to feel they're part of the story going forward with it. And mm -hmm. so I don't want to take them out. So I try to keep things very true to how things really are. And that's why I'm saying I've kind of done these stories where they're very true to people and moments that have already happened and now we're just kind of retelling those stories in a in a different way you mentioned that you were a child actor so how how has that really helped you with your directing yeah so uh, you know it's funny i feel like you you learn by making mistakes right uh and mm -hmm. instead of like reading books and going to film school and everything else you do my film school was acting as a kid and even producing my first movie at 21 we had no idea what we were doing <laughs> There was yeah I've I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been there. <laughs> I got into producing because uh, a bunch of us actors were uh, smoking cigars and playing <laughs> poker up at a friend's house up on the hills, and mm -hmm. they were very successful actors, and I was okay. <laughs> I'd done like kid Power Ranger shows and stuff like that, but these guys were a much right. higher level. So we were all smoking, and, and during poker, we just made a bet, like, hey, let's just make our own movie, and so we all put, you know put our money into it and just made this film. And that was kind of like my film school, just seeing how it all came together. And I was like really in love with the process of it. And I never really, I loved acting and I appreciate it. It's really hard, the ups and downs. And I, I love actors mm -hmm. for going through that and staying with it. And um, mm -hmm. so I reward them, but I personally was much happier behind the scenes. I don't really like the whole stardom on my personal <laughs> life in front of everybody. I'm more private. If you can tell looking me up, it's harder to look me up. But, yeah, um, during the re during the research, you were yeah. you know on IMDb, you're there, but on Google, yeah, that was on purpose. <laughs> um, it's okay, I figured, I private. figured. Yeah, but but my um, anyway, so so that film it was called Random Acts of Violence. That was the first movie that we did with these guys, and they were such cool guys. We had so much fun, um, and so, some of the guys still I, I, I stay in touch with now, but. Um, that movie, and I did a young Gary Sinise one day player on this movie, the championship, uh, that championship season with Paul Servino directing. And I got oh, to play okay. the young Gary Sinise for the day. And all through my youth of castings, they'd always say, you know, you look like Gary Sinise. I always heard it. And of course, mm -hmm. I get the call one day, hey, you're going to play the young Gary. Yeah, and okay. I was so excited. And I got to go into his trailer <laughs> and give him my headshot and say, look, if you ever need a younger you again, here I am. And uh, it was just, it was so cool and he was nice. And then that was actually one of the last things I ever did as an actor. And um, 
then I just started getting into producing and casting movies and I started directing little music videos and shorts and, uh, right. you know, whatever I could get my hands on as a kid. And then, you know, over time, producing, producing and producing and going in all the edit rooms and everything else that helped me like really yes. hone in the directing side of me. Editing it took, yeah. took a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, so learning how to edit was very helpful in learning how to be a director. Like, do you, do you see sort of that edit in your head while you're, while you're directing? Absolutely. I took editing. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I did editing for years as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, in my twenties, just to kind of like mm -hmm. figure it all out. I wanted to know all aspects. I even did first AD, you know, I did camera operating, you know, I did PA work. I worked under Dan Guzzleman, the perfect game as a PA. I worked at the pretender as a, my friend was in the writing room as an assistant. And when he would leave town, I would cover him. And so mm -hmm. I just wanted to learn everything. So I knew yeah. how it all worked. How, you're right. So I was a student of everything. Like I was just a sponge. I just took it all in. Mm -hmm. I, I sucked it up. You know, I, I took, it took a long time, but um, you know, now it's, it, it taught me, to, you know, everything that I need, that I have now. And each film I do, I just feel like more and more, it just kind of really makes sense. And it, now it's just become second nature and it's fun. You know, I don't, right. I don't even think about it anymore. I just do it. And it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great feeling. Right. You said with Crescent City that it all came together really fast. Like, so how fast is fast to you? Like in movie making, that you're could gonna, be. You're going to laugh at my producers <laughs> and the, the film commissioner was like, you have two and a half weeks up to prep. What? Like you just got here. Um, the, we had to go because the SAG waiver came in. It took a while mm -hmm. to get it. And then we had a window with the actors all together. And so we had to cram it in and everybody right, was right. shocked because we were originally going to Vegas uh, because I've shot two movies there, uh, three movies. And I love Vegas. I love the cruise. Right. It's a, it's a second home to me. It's a lot closer to Los Angeles, but what a surprise little rock was. It just, it was amazing. The film commissioner, the people there, they opened the town to us. They gave us the police force. You know, the mayor, we met at the cigar lounge there. I mean, right. it was such a fun experience. We want to go back. But, um, I think we're going back in like two months for another production now. But okay. I mean, it was just I, I was so shocked how much I loved it. And I, um, I love Little Rock and the film community there is really growing. And they're really, a really talented crew there as well. I mean, Vegas has a great crew as well. Right. But um, I loved it. It was great. You mentioned that you've done comedy, you've done, you know, drama what's your favorite and then which one's sort of more difficult to you or if if so i would say comedy is the hardest thing to do mm -hmm. and don't suck was the second film i directed and you know jamie kennedy and matt I me mean, matt reif has just become this mega star right. which i yeah. knew he was like he's phenomenal and this is all like a shout out to jay davis i've known him forever he even gave me like my first bar job uh, in Hollywood and he helped me when I was a young actor trying to make it mm -hmm. and he he was running the Laugh Factory at the time and Rick D'Elia uh, pitched me this project in Vegas when I went out to go see a show and I met him mm -hmm. he he said look I have this really great script it's this vampire comedy and I'm like oh my god this sounds terrible <laughs> it sounds like the worst movie ever but I watched his stand up that night and he was so good he was so funny and I loved him as a person. I was like, you know, I'm going to read it. So the next day, hung over from Vegas. I read the script. And I couldn't put it down. And it was such a great script. I was like, oh, my God. I, I, I don't know how to pitch this, but I love this movie. So mm. then we talked about putting it together. And, and uh, over time, we did it. And Jay, Jay Davis said, look, you got to come to the show and watch Matt Wright, this young kid. He's, he's mm. really talented. So I take my wife and we go to the show. And we saw Matt. We're like, yep, that's the guy. And right. we you know, he was so cool and young and humble. And we, he, uh, what, what, what happened next? Oh yeah. So he did <laughs> self tape for us and mm -hmm. knocked out of the park. He was perfect. And so we had Jamie Kennedy, we had Matt Reif in there. And then uh, a really close friend of mine, Higa Machado introduced me to uh, Russell Peters. Okay. And yes. so I went up to Russell Peters house. We smoked a cigar. We talked about everything, music, everything else. He was like, all right, we I'll do this with you guys. <laughs> cool. So that worked out. Um, yeah, Hegan's a great friend of mine. And um, mm -hmm. Ellen Holman came through a really good friend of mine, Lauren Shaw, who's a stunt coordinator, actor as well, and producer. She's amazing. And mm -hmm. it's just always about these people connecting the dots and introducing us mm -hmm. to the right people. And Ellen was just fresh off of uh, the new Matrix. Okay. Um, and so she was phenomenal as Jimmy Kennedy's uh, girlfriend in the movie. 
Yeah, it's funny so, you mentioned Jamie Kennedy. Actually, one of my friends is his assistant. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Want, should I say your name on there? Is Alyssa? <laughs> Uh, no, um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> we'll, okay. we'll, 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 anyway, yeah, no, um, Jamie, by the way, yeah. we became like brothers. We were, he's, he's such a better golfer than me. I can't stand it. <laughs> uh, but we have, you know, he's such a cool guy and, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about the release of don't suck. It's going to come out December 1st and all the VOD platforms and it'll mm -hmm. be in like, uh, selected theaters all over America from Dallas, Austin, Atlanta. Okay. That's great. Yeah. yeah. How LA. important is how important is getting a theatrical release these days? Because, you know, not every movie does that now. Well, funny, you know, I think the audience members are changing their way of attention spans, as we keep being told, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate, in my opinion. But I still love the theater. So right. if your movie can make it to the theaters at all, I feel like that's a win, um, right. even if it's more of a selected small group of them. But um, I think it's very important just for me just to know that people can see it on the big screen. Because when we screened Don't Suck in Vegas at the theater, it was such a different experience than watching it on, you know, your 50 inch or 70. Well, yeah, because especially with comedy, I know everyone has a different sense of humor. Like I have a very dark sense of humor. And when I went to watch what movie, it was a, a Coen brother movie, Burn After Reading. There was only me and one other person in the audience when... Uh, I think it was John Malkovich puts an ax in somebody's head and we, me and this other guy, sorry, this other guy and I, we just start busting up. Okay. We're like, and no one else in the theater laughed. And we were just like, okay. We're like, yeah. You know, you know, what's funny about that. It's like, there was <laughs>, laughs that I got from certain scenes that I didn't even expect. Think, yeah, and exactly. Some of the moments that I thought were funny were not as funny for the audience. And I'm like, so it just really depends on each, like you said, it just depends on each audience yeah. member, right? But right. Uh, it was great to see like a theater packed full of people and they were really enjoying the film. And I'm like, okay, so I feel like we got something here. You know, you know, it, it, it was a labor of love. We did two movies during COVID where it was extremely low budgets and a little bit of crew because you just couldn't have a lot of people because you were afraid you're going right. to get shut down if someone tested positive for COVID. And so we kept our crews really tight and small and we all had to do a lot of different, wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. But it was, uh, but it was worth it. It was definitely worth it. You've already sort of illustrated throughout our interview so far how important, you know, just knowing people is and networking. Could you sort of elaborate more on like how important networking and building those relationships has been to your career? Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's a lot of it comes down to trust, mm -hmm. right? It's like, you know, you have to kind of they got to know you're not one of these one timers that's coming in with this big story and this whole thing and it just doesn't happen or it falls apart. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to earn the respect of trust first, but uh, you know, there, you know, there's so many different ways that people come into this, you know, to this business and make it, you know, if you're a young producer and you're very eager, you either have to have a really good strong piece of IP or a really good book rights, or you have to, another way to really get in there is to know how to raise money. I mean, money is so key to this. And then Can't learning the without business. the money. Yeah, no, I mean, really, like some <laughs> people come in with like some big financiers and they just paint the town red. They do it all. I mean, it's it's impressive. Um, yes. And some people, it takes a long time to learn how to raise money. And, and what is the secret to raising money? Is there a secret? <laughs> Can you tell I, us? Yeah, I, I honestly think that if you truly believe in the story mm -hmm. and you're passionate about it, and there's a sexiness to the Hollywood business. Now, I've learned how to make money and I've learned how to lose money. And that's <laughs> why now I've gotten into the point where now we're doing film finance because I've made money, I've lost money, and I know exactly how to see how films are making money now and how they lose money. Okay. And so this segues into what I just started with this, this company with the, you know, a bunch of other partners we're starting with. Uh, but that's it's called Elevate. Elevate. Yeah, it's yeah. Literally, we're literally closing all the legal documents this week and this film, this film mm -hmm. fund is starting. And we're, you know, we've just learned that to it's we're essentially like a bank lender, but you know, we'll we know how to close fast and um we're gonna take chances on certain things, but we it's really collateralizing the movies from mm -hmm. having minimum guarantees for the distributors for domestic, it's having the right foreign sales companies and the tax credits. And those three entities are how you finance movies. Right. What is the best piece of advice someone has given to you in your career so far? Shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, literally like, 
you know, when you're young, you really think you know it all. And as you get older, yes. you realize that you don't know anything. And everything you learn, you keep relearning. And it's, it's just a constant learning process. So the more you're open to listening to people around you, when you're a young, eager director mm -hmm. or producer, you think you know it all and you don't necessarily think you need to listen. But I mean, I've, I luckily have had, had a chance to work on some pretty big productions where I was more, of, let's just say like a PA or a visitor on set and very big directors mm -hmm. and their HODs are head of departments. You know, we're talking to the director and giving them ideas sometimes. And it's not like, you know, directors, you know, I think the best directors are ones that can also be open to listening to their team and trusting them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my attitude is this, if I'm shooting a scene and someone comes up to me and tells me something that's like, like, like something I didn't even think of that makes it so much better. Why would I not use that? You right. Know, like exactly. You have to be open to good advice, but also, you know, respecting your crew and people and everything else is all part of that. And if you trust your departments, your heads and they're doing their job, it just makes yourself look even better. So I'm always I'm always an open book to that, like be open to you know, criticism, be open to people telling you ideas and, and, you know, there's some nice ways to say, Oh yeah. Okay. Let me think about, you know, or something like that, but you don't have to always do it, but the right ones are really going to make you better. So I think it's a collaboration of a lot of different people. I don't even think like a director is the end all be all to anything. I think it's, uh, it's a collaboration of a lot of great right. people together. Yeah. You have a whole team of people and how much does like the idea of what you think the movie is going to be like, during your prep and pre-production and then when you get to set so you just sort of let it organically come like you have a guideline and then you sort of just go with the flow like how do you approach that yeah so uh the dp and i get together and we do our shot list and we create what the emotions are going to be and what we want out of each scene and then like you said they do evolve um but they you know we have a pretty good idea now it's just, that's experience, right? The more and more, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain shots that I really have to have for adding in, inserting CGI and effects into it. Um, so we really plan out those shots even more in detail and we're shooting our plates and stuff like that. But um, I think it's, it evolves sometimes, but it's pretty close to what we usually want. Um, and then you'll get those little hidden buttons where these actors come in and just give you something even yeah. on top of that that you didn't expect and it blows you away. And those are the magic moments. Right. Are there any opportunities that you've had in your career that you said no to that later in hindsight you wished you had to said yes to? Yeah, I can tell you a few scripts that I passed on putting money into <laughs> that <laughs> made over $200 million in the box <laughs> office and worldwide that you regret. <laughs> I don't want to name things, but uh, yeah, there's been moments. Uh, yeah, yeah, especially as a, as a financier producer as well. There's some projects that I am kicking myself in the head for not taking. Why didn't you take those? Was there something about it that just didn't resonate with you or? Well, it's, you know, there's some movies that, that are risky, but the, you know, they're worth it in the end. And mm -hmm. sometimes when you have some finance groups that you're working with, if they don't want to take that risk. They won't take those movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've had a few of those come by. And then I had one that I was negotiating a deal and the, the, the legal side of it stopped it from happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, look, it's, you're going to have those and you can't look at your life and go, I made a mistake right. yeah. for that one. It's just whatever reason, like things happen the way they're going to happen in your life. That's the way I look at right. it. Right. Well, you have to, you can't live in the past. You have to just keep going forward. So, yeah. But yeah, the answer is I've done this. A few times. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> How do you decide what to say yes to when you're looking for a film or a screenplay? I think it's something that's going to challenge me and it's something different that I haven't already done. You know, that's, that's kind of the, I mean, it's always, it's weird for me. It's like, if I can't put a script down and it's, it, it moves me and makes me just super excited. I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, those are the kind of projects I'm looking for. And I'll be honest, I read so many scripts mm -hmm. and usually by page 20 or 30, I mean, they're like, I can't, I can't keep reading or I just can't put it down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, and then I share it with a few trusted colleagues right. and if they all kind of share the same thoughts. I mean, I've, I went to bat on one script that other people didn't agree with me on, and that one turned out really well. But, you know, it's usually a team effort, but I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do next. And uh, it's all about just the writing and the and how I'm feeling when I'm when I'm you know reading it. And if I can't stop thinking about the story after that, it's, that usually makes me want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It stays with you. 
-hmm. What would your biggest tip be to someone that was wanting to move to LA and pursue a career in filmmaking? I would tell them to turn around and go home. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just totally kidding. Uh, no, I would say that just come out open-minded, be, be ready to work hard and spend a lot of time on it mm -hmm. because it's not an easy road and it's not a fast fix. You have to put the time in, you got to learn it. You have to own it. You have to keep doing it. You're going to fail. You're going to be told you can't do it. And if you keep pushing past those no's that are constantly in front of you, right. you can't do this, you can't do that. And you just keep showing and proving that you're just going to keep doing it and they can't keep knocking you down. I mean, I've been punched in the face so many times it feels like, <laughs> no, and I just keep moving forward. And, and that if you're open to doing that and being open to failing, that's where you're going to be okay down the road if you keep pushing forward. And having that perseverance and grit to just... Yeah, keep going I mean, no matter all what. hours of the day and night. Sometimes it drives my wife crazy, but I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a workaholic. Right. Well, I think you need to be that way for, especially in this industry. I don't know about others, but definitely in this one. So, what are you most grateful for in your career? <sighs> wow. I'm. You know, it's funny. I'm grateful for my wife, mm -hmm. my mom. Um, what else? Um, the trust that they've like put into me over the years to like my craziness. And um, <laughs> I'm grateful for my friendships I've built. I'm grateful for the producers I'm working with. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for all the opportunities that I keep getting, you know, and it's like this last movie I directed was by far the biggest movie of actors. And my for mm -hmm. me as a director, and it was like a, a gift from God. And I was like, thank you. And um, I just keep moving forward. But uh no, I'm, I'm grateful for a lot of things. It's just the opportunities keep coming. And um, uh, I'm grateful for the friends I've made in this business and allies and nice. for all the doubters and people that try to <laughs> just knock you down, just got to keep getting past them. And you're know, right. swimming with the sharks out here in Hollywood, but um, there's a lot of great ones too. Right. Just got to cool. find the right people. Yeah. In regards to filmmaking, who or what inspires you and what, is the favorite movie that you have done? Someone else asked me that question about the favorite movie, but uh, I'll say, um, you know, I love Tarantino for his just, <laughs> his honesty, his mm -hmm. craziness. He just does what he wants. He doesn't care. Um, his freedom, he gives his talent. Like he's a good person to admire and, um, I love David Fincher's style from his music to his, just his stylistics to everything is like with him. It's like, he's a, he's a post maniac. I mean, just the visuals that he, that he pulls off with all the effects that you don't even know he's doing in each shot. It's, it's so inc incredible. Uh, God rest Tony Scott's life, but he, yes. man on fire was, I think a perfect movie. Um, mm -hmm. True romance was one of my favorite yeah. movies, Scarface, Godfather. Yes. I mean, there's like, you know, Top Gun as a kid, Back <laughs> to the Future, uh, Goonies. Like, I love family adventure stories, too. I actually love The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. Like, <laughs> the simplicity of that movie and the fun ride he, he puts you through. And he's so just likable as a character. Um, and I got to meet him and take him to a Laker game. And okay. uh, Brendan was one of the nicest, sweetest guys. I mean, he is. Um, and I'm so happy that he's made his resurgence again because he's right. such a good being. But... There's just a lot of different people like that that affect you. And it just kind of like gives you hope that in this business, there's a lot of good people behind you know, the wall of the agents and everybody that blocks you from people. And they have to protect their clients, make sure they're in the right hands. And I, I respect that process. But yeah, it's a, uh, once you got to break through those walls and you start to work with these people, um, it really is, it does become a different experience than when you're fresh and new and everybody's kind of saying, you don't have anything to show me. Right. Do you have a shout out to anyone that's really been instrumental in helping you or slapping you or pushing you along the way? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's funny, but there's, you know, there's a lot of people along the way that have really kind of helped in certain ways and some that didn't even realize they helped from even mm -hmm. a producer that I worked with that kind of put me through the ringer. But, you know, he didn't even know he was like <laughs> he was teaching me what not to do. <laughs> but I would say. I would say there's there's an agent that I really appreciated at the time. Her name was Christina De Souza, mm -hmm. but she ended up marrying um, and becoming Christina De Souza Geld. 
but she was a very helpful agent for me when I was kind of starting to really get into my stride of producing. Um, but she was very helpful. How Helen, so? How, how, how was she helpful? Opening the door. She would go, I'm going to introduce you to this person. I'm going to help you with this thing. Um, she just was very helpful. You know, and it's like, for me, I don't ever forget the people that, that, that believe in you and helped you regardless of what other people may have thought, or he was not experienced mm -hmm. enough or whatever else, but she was very helpful in that sense. Um, uh, Helen Lee Kim, mm -hmm. she's now a Lionsgate um, head of international sales, but she was with Good Universe for a while. She was very instrumental in teaching me everything. She was such a nice person to me in the business. She still is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Helen, I, I met Helen through my 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 old partner Justin Begnaud at a, when we were a global film group together. But we made the one of the films I'm very proud of, to be honest. Out of all the things you asked me, the True Memoirs of an International Assassin. Was, I love that movie. That movie was, was good. I mean, look, I love Kevin James. He's such a good soul. What a great, amazing actor. He's so fun. We we had this amazing script that my friend Jeff Morris. He said, we, I read the script a while back and it was taken um, and then the company went under and wanted to turn around and he called me and said, if you're still serious with the script, you have 20, you have 24 hours to get it. Mm -hmm. So we, we raised, we raised the option money that day, oh, called wow. him the next day and said, I'll take it. <laughs> and he had a phenomenal director attached, attached to it, fresh off of a huge hit on the theaters. And so we were like, this is a no brainer. And we took it to good universe. They loved it. Um, they signed on right away and we were off to the runnings and then uh, we had to change directors just because of timing. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got Kevin James and when Good Universe went to go sell this at Cannes, Ted Sarandos came and he said, we want the world now, don't sell it. And then the movie basically went from an independent budget to a studio style film with Netflix and it was a third original production with Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I got, we got to work with Todd Gardner, the big senior producer he came on and really kind of showed us the ropes and he was amazing. Um, and it was just such a great experience. And it showed me like what a big studio budget feels like to work with. <laughs> that was the biggest film budget wise I worked on. And it was uh, when we were kind of up and coming producers and it was a, um, it was a great experience and it definitely kind of tipped the hat for my productions and, and really kind of paved the way for us to, to right. put our name out there. What's the biggest difference between like a, big studio production versus an indie production other than money? The difference is, well, independently, you, you're you you're answering to the investors, but they're usually more kind of like, uh, I would say less hands-on, right? Mm -hmm. A studio, you have the execs that all have their opinion on everything, and you have to you know learn how to navigate that with the creatives. And so there's that kind of, the creatives want one thing, the executives want one thing. On an independent film, it's a little bit of an easier mesh together, <laughs> okay? Usually we have a lot more freedom to all freedom to do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Now in studio films, obviously you're dealing with the executives and all their notes and everybody has to kind of collaborate and listen. And then there's the lead actor, you know, Kevin James had some great notes in the script that he wanted for his character and Jeff Wadlow mm -hmm. did those notes and Todd Gardner helped that. And I just learned by watching Todd and these guys work together and how they put it together. Obviously we set up the original part of the film and we helped produce mm -hmm. it all the way through but it was a great learning experience for me. And um, I'll never forget that experience because it was uh, it was amazing to see that I fought for that script and I got it and really made that mm -hmm. thing happen. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just, a, it was a great feeling. Of course, then congrats. <laughs> Thanks. When, when it comes to the notes, what happens if, you know, there's just disagreement on the notes? Like let's- <laughs> <laughs> What happens? <laughs> Someone's got to be in the middle and mediate it <laughs> and get And how, how it does that work? It, well, you know, it, that's a, that's a lot of massaging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a lot of uh, cigars or drinks or meals or discussions, mm. but usually we find a happy medium between everybody. Okay. It does take a little bit of finagling sometimes, but um, usually, usually it works out pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, that's my political way of saying it. But um, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a juggle. You just have to juggle the business. So there's there's two parts of this business. There's the creative side and then there's the business side. And if people don't respect the business side, then the creative, this is why things fall apart or don't happen. 
So if you can know how to navigate between both these and make them work, mm -hmm. that's what a producer. I mean, if um, what what is the? I'm sorry, the uh, the amazing show. I just I just kind of watched it on Paramount Plus, uh, The Offer. Okay. Oh, someone mentioned that to me. I have to watch it. You have, I have not producer, watched it yet. Filmmaker, director, whatever. Just watch that and watch what that producer had to go through to get that movie made, The Godfather. <laughs> it's an amazing story. It says a lot about what we deal with. But right. I didn't have to deal with the mob trying to kill me. So <laughs> thank God. Well, that's a plus. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's just, I mean, look, you just have to be really a problem solver and know how to navigate through people's personalities. That's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of the business, you know, to be honest. It's just navigating and knowing how, you know, different personality types respond differently to things and using different tactics. <laughs> yeah, you just have to kind of like be, play devil's advocate and but just, usually try to stay as much in the middle as possible to listen to both sides and try to make it work. That's okay. the best advice I can give you. I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds, believe me, but um, that's usually what we end up having to do a lot of. What's your next project that you're doing? Well, you know, it's funny. We have a whole slate of projects um, mm -hmm. from thrillers. I love action comedies. I've been wanting to do something big, like the true memoirs movie again. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a, pretty big action comedy with uh, millennium that we are still setting up. Um, I have a boatload of thrillers and, you know, I have another action comedy I want to do called treasure beach that my uh, good friend, Josh Cohen wrote. He actually passed away unfortunately last year. So mm -hmm. uh, Edward and I want to make sure that that movie goes, but it's a fantastic fun ride. Um, but yeah, we are into the um, action films, action comedies, thrillers and sci-fi thrillers those are pretty much our sweet spots right now okay. and the budget ranges from you know five million to you know 40 million but but uh yeah we we're in the independent space and uh we are pretty savvy at raising financing and packaging projects now so we're having a good time right now i know you said you're private but is there a way for us to find you online <laughs> <laughs> so on instagram uh, at director RJC. Yeah. Okay. You can uh, message me on Instagram there. Um, you know, it just, I appreciate people that really fight for their storytelling. Um, so mm -hmm. if we bump into each other and, or I hear about something, I'm happy to always look at things if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty busy, but I'm always open to circumstance, you know, so. To the networking and serendipitous moments, right? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, RJ. You gave us a lot of insightful information and some good stories. So thanks so much. Well, and thanks so much. Will, yeah, and I'm see you out and about somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so everybody, don't forget, December 1st, look out for Don't Suck. Uh, Matt Reif, Jamie Kennedy, Russell Peters, Carrot Top, uh, Jimmy Schubert, Ellen Holman, and a bunch of others. It's, uh, it's an amazing, fun cast. And uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And see you next time. Bye. Thank Thanks.